Thank you, Master Lord, Father God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Come on, can we thank the Lord for what he's done for them? Come on, we've been in this series, Eight Youth, and that simply means God do it again with the same power and authority. So uh, thanks again to Sontosh and Jessica. Come on, they're right back there. Can, can you guys stand up a little bit and just wave at everybody? Is that okay? Come on, let's thank them for sharing. And Enoch's right there. Sleeping. He didn't wake up when I came and saw him in the NICU either. That's okay. Some people say my voice puts their kids to sleep, and so that's just my wife's opinion. But anyway, no, I'm just kidding. That's great to be here. So let me just uh, highlight, too, what they said there. I just believe if you're still believing like they were as well, keep on believing, keep on praying. Don't be afraid to meet with prayer partners. Don't be afraid to talk to them. And uh, it's God who does the work, but there's something special that happens when we link our faith together. When we agree with one another, we're reminded that we're not going through this on our own, right? That's one of the cool things I love about Scoreboard Sunday is we hear testimonies of what God has been doing. It builds our faith that he's gonna do it again with the same power and authority, but we see whether it's uh, in young people or um, 50 plus people, right, Tom? 50 plus, that's, or a lot of pluses. But whatever it is, he said he qualified for the seniors ministry too. So it doesn't matter what we call it. He says he qualifies. But no matter where we are on our journey with the Lord, we're not walking alone. And it's a joy to walk with other people of faith and linking together. Amen? All right. So it's great to see you here this morning. Welcome to those watching and worshiping online. We're uh, continuing this series, which is kind of like finishing it, but it's our theme for the year, Hey, Duth, God, do it again. And uh, so today is Scoreboard Sunday. As Pastor Josh said, we're going to be celebrating uh, the whole service, what God has done in many of our lives, believing that he's not done, that he's going to keep doing it in other people's lives. So today uh, is our last day of our 21 days of prayer and fasting. Come on, you made it. Here we are. Um, I know some of you were like, at 12 o'clock, I'm going to eat lunch. Probably not, because service won't be over at 12, but that's okay. Just thought I'd let you know in advance. There's no football till 2, so you're not eating at 12. But it's okay. You don't want to leave and miss more testimonies and more baptisms. But uh, I just want to give a big thank you, and I think it'd be appropriate for our whole church family to say thank you to the team that wrote this devotional all under the leadership of Pastor Vicente, who's up interpreting for our Celebration Espanol. Can we say thank you to that team for their hard work? We appreciate it so much in Pastor Vicente's leadership. Uh, I mentioned on Wednesday night at prayer gathering, by the way, we've just been experiencing the presence of God in just incredibly new ways uh, every Wednesday. But I mentioned that coming up in February, this upcoming Sunday, one week from now, we've got one of my biggest missionary heroes, one of my biggest heroes who is a missionary, an awesome guy. He's, he's little, but he's awesome. Missionary Darth Lee will be with us from Cambodia. He had escaped the Pol Pot regime. And uh, I just warn you in advance, you're going to leave encouraged for serving the Lord Jesus, but bring your tissues uh, and your checkbook for that matter so we can be part of what God is doing there in Cambodia. But he'll be with us next week, so be here. But then in February, I felt during this 21 days of prayer and fasting, even just this last week, such a confirmation that we're to continue on with this theme of battle ready. So for February and March, I'm gonna be teaching training on spiritual warfare uh, from Ephesians chapter six. And so we wanna put on the full armor of God. So don't miss it. We're gonna be uh, teaching on that. And so uh, I believe in that God's best days are still ahead for us. And Jesus said the gates of hell will not prevail against him building his church. And so I don't know if you've seen those studies that say the church is going backwards, but those studies were not based upon interviews here at Celebration Church. Amen. So I'm confident that Jesus is building his church and what a privilege it is for us to be part of it. Can I get a good amen? Amen. All right. If you have a Bible, you could turn to Jeremiah chapter 18. If you're able, would you stand to your feet this morning as we read God's word together? Our theme verses for the year are found in Psalm 126. Verse four says it. It says, and now God do it. Again, that's what we're believing, not just in this series, but throughout the year. Spoiler alert, we're going to believe next year he'll do it again like he does it again. But uh, anyway, for at least this year, this is our theme verse. Last week, we uh, had talked and prayed and thanked God for so many miracles titled, God Answered So Many Prayers, right out of First, uh, Second Corinthians chapter 1. We were reminded that we're never going to take for granted again the privilege of praying for somebody else. When somebody brings that prayer request to us, they're putting their hope in God 
but they're putting our tru- their trust in us that we'll bring those requests before the throne of God. So what a joy it is. And Paul even thanked the believers in Corinth. He said, you are helping us by your prayers. And so uh, we're believing that today. Jeremiah chapter 18, it's scoreboard Sunday. And uh, so we're gonna look at this. We're gonna celebrate with water baptism. And uh, in the first service, I think there was nine that were baptized in water. This service, there's 23 signed up. I don't know if there's any more or what, where we stand with that, but we're gonna give God thanks and pray. So Jeremiah chapter 18, verses one to six, uh, the Bible reads like this. This is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Go down to the potter's house and there I'll give you my message. So I went down to the potter's house and I saw him working at the wheel. But the pot he was shaping from the clay was marred in his hands. So the potter formed it uh, into another pot, shaping it as seemed best to him. The word of the Lord came to me. He said, can I not do with Israel as this potter does, declares the Lord, like clay in the hand of the potter, so are you in my hand, Israel. Talking about what happens when we're baptized in water, celebrating what God is doing, these testimonies here today on School Board Sunday. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the great revelation, the great gift of your son, Jesus. We ask, Holy Spirit, give us ears to hear what you're saying. Thank you for what you've done before. Thank you what you are doing now. And we give you thanks in advance for what you're going to do in the days, weeks, months, years ahead until Jesus, you return for your church. We ask, may you be honored and glorified with everything we say and do today. We pray it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. 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 You may be seated. Uh, Give a little apology to the Team, I just realized I read from a different translation than I gave them. <laughs> That's what happens when I don't look at my notes and I just feel inspired, okay? So sorry about that. I will read the rest of them from the screen, well, from my notes that will match the screen and uh, praise the Lord. Anyway, number one, as we're talking here on Scoreboard Sunday, I want you to know these are things that uh, are not about a water baptism in Jeremiah. I just read it. It's about the text or the potter there, the clay, but I believe they're true for us, especially here on Baptism Sunday, school board Sunday. Number one, simple obedience leads to revelation. This is what happened. He was praying and the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah and the word that he heard was go somewhere else, do something different, and then you'll hear again. Does that confuse anybody else? Even as a pastor, I'm reading this thinking, God, if you believe that Jeremiah was hearing from you, why didn't you just give him the whole explanation at one time? Maybe uh, I just was thinking, you know, you've got his attention. He's listening. He's journaling. If God could trust him to say, hey, I'm going to give you instruction, go over there and I'll give you something else. Why didn't he just say it at one time? And I was reminded that Jeremiah, like all of us, we're prone. We're humans. We're prone to trying to do things in our own way, in our own understanding. But serving the Lord Jesus is all about following following him and his ways. It's not about if we're trained as a counselor for an Edina school system. It's God, what are you asking me to do? It's not really even what I want to do, but am I willing to do what you ask me to do? And it was very simple. God told Jeremiah, just go over there and then I'll talk to you. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. You may be familiar with these words, right? Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. When you come across something that makes sense and when it doesn't, do whichever one God says. That's what he's talking about here, right? In all your ways, submit them to him and he will make your paths straight. I believe many believers, not in the 1045 service, but the ones that came earlier today, many believers, that's a joke, I made it to them too. It was funny, even though you didn't laugh. Many believers miss significant revelation because they refuse simple obedience. A lot of us would say, oh, I want significant revelation from God. I want something awe-inspiring, but we miss it because we choose not to simply obey. Another way to say, we're waiting for something mystical, magical, fireworks to go off, and we refuse to just get up and read the word he already gave us. Right? He's like, I want to talk to you. Will you pray? And we're like, let it be an airplane bubble riding in the sky. Then I'll know it's you. (laughs) He's like, I spoke to dozens of dudes a long time ago to give you my word. It's easier to have one airplane. You know, we don't need God to write messages in the clouds. 
We do need him for this. And so we, we miss out on some significant revelation because we ignore, we skip over, we trivialize simple obedience. I was reminded on this idea of Naaman in 2 Kings chapter 5. Do you remember that story? He had leprosy. He had a skin condition and he went to see the prophet. He went to see the man of God and he wanted the man of God to say, hear ye, hear ye. This is what you should do. And he was like, go dip in the Jordan River. And Naaman was like, and it was a servant girl that was like, hey, if he had asked you to do something crazy, your faith would have been built up. You would have been inspired by the eloquence of the message and you would have acted in obedience. But because you didn't like The way the prophet said it. Because you weren't impressed by his eloquence and dance moves. You were like, I'm too good for that. And she said, do you want to obey and be healed? Or do you want to be impressed? (laughs) See, here's one of the problems. Whenever we come to the man of God to be impressed instead of empowered, it's gonna be this cycle of never-ending impress me, preacher boy. And Naaman would have missed out if he didn't obey. It's something so simple, but it brought great Revelation. Here we are on Scoreboard Sunday. In a few minutes, we're going to celebrate with a couple dozen people going public with their faith, saying, I've been made new. It's a simple act of obedience. We, we see throughout Scripture, repent and be baptized. It's a very simple thing. I've jokingly referred to this baptismal take as our holy hot tub. It might be our holy warm tub. I'm not really sure. It doesn't feel that hot anymore, but... Praise the Lord, you're getting baptized anyway. We find out how sanctified you are depending on the temperature level that's working there. If you want it warmer, be baptized in the nine o'clock. It's fine. But anyway, um, it's something simple, but we believe something significant happens. Most of us in the room have been swimming before in a bathtub, and so it's not like the first time we've gone underwater. But there's something different that we believe happens a simple act of obedience bringing great revelation. We see this with Jesus, right? Jesus was the son of God and he went there to the river and and he was baptized by John the Baptist. And when Jesus came back up out of the water, the Bible says the heavens opened, the Holy Spirit descended on him as a dove and the voice, the words of approval from the father could be heard, not just by Jesus, but by everybody else. Catch this, Jesus' simple act of obedience brought revelation to everybody that was there that day. This is why we don't just baptize people one-on-one by ourselves. There's something about a corporate community, a group of people saying, we're experiencing this together. Did you know nobody baptizes themselves? There's always two or more in the tank, and that's a picture of our Christian community. It's not supposed to be lived in isolation. We're not supposed to go through this life on our own, whether we're praying for miracles or believing for God to come through or just simply obeying and being baptized in water. It's meant to be experienced within the context of community and simple obedience. Why? It's a physical experience. They're actually going to get dunked underwater. It's a physical experience that demonstrates the spiritual encounter. And it's hard for me to explain to somebody, well, what's it going to be like? Well, you're going to be wet, but you've been wet before, but something different is going to happen. Now, I'm definitely not suggesting or even hoping that like when somebody comes up out of the water, the roof falls apart. You know what I'm saying? Because it's cold out there and we don't need a hole in the roof. (laughs) But I guess if the Lord wants to do it, he can fix it. You know, we had a meeting with our insurance. We're covered again this year, but I'm just saying, Lord, (laughs) do a miracle instead. But, But something is going to happen. Even if it's not the same as what happened with Jesus, I believe something significant happens whenever we do it. What are we declaring when we go under the water? We're saying we're dead to sin. 
And when we come back up, we're saying we're alive in Christ. We're declaring I've been made new. Maybe you grew up in a different faith tradition than uh, here at Celebration and, and you were baptized or sprinkled, you know, as an infant, little kid, whatever. We're not belittling your experience or putting it down or making fun of you anyway, just explaining that we believe water baptism is what, what takes place after you give your life to Jesus Christ. So once you're old enough to recognize that your sin has separated you from God, you repent of your sin and then you go public with what God has done for you. We, we do uh, child dedications, but that's what the parents want to do for their kid. I've never met an infant that was like, I'm ready to surrender my life to Jesus. <laughs> They're like, mine, you know, whatever it is. So that's just explaining what we do. But we're dead to sin, alive in Christ. Here's number two. Uh, our failures aren't final. This is something we see in scripture. We've experienced it in our lives. And I believe we declare when we're baptized in water, we are declaring for everybody that can see my failures weren't final. The Bible says that, that he went down to the potter's house and while he was there making it, the vessel that he had made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. Marred is not an everyday word that we use anymore, but it means damaged or spoiled. I was explaining it to some of the younger staff members that had never heard the word marred. I don't know what version of the Bible they're reading or if they've skipped over that book in the Bible. We'll talk about that later. But I said, it's like they were just messed up jacked up, tore up, whatever you want to say, they had an issue. And yet, the Bible says it was marred in the hand of the potter. Growing up, I uh, really struggled with being a perfectionist. And so, you know, even coloring examples, uh, teachers didn't have to tell me to stay within the lines. I got really mad if my crayon barely slipped outside the line. And so I would crumple that piece of paper up and I would throw it away because I wanted it to be perfect. And that was a struggle as a kid, but it was a struggle on my own. When I got to junior high, there was a whole new struggle called group projects. Now, I know for some of you, that improved your academic experience. <laughs> but it was like a wrestling for me because, you know, A wasn't enough. I wanted like the best score in the class. And now my public approval rating was determined and dependent upon some of y'all slackers. <laughs> and nothing messed with my perfectionist spirit more than not being able to control so the truth is, even in group projects, I began to do more than my fair share because I was like, I'd rather do more work and get an A than do my share and get a B. <laughs> some of you are like, I'd give anything to get a B. You know? so, anyway, that's just where I was at here. So you graduated, it's fine. Okay, but <laughs> then I got married. Now, by the way, there's a significant time lapse there between junior high and marriage, okay? There's like 10 years that I'm just gonna fast forward for the sake of time because we got some baptisms. Then I got married and I found out how wrong I had been. When I was single, my mom never told me how often I was wrong, but then I got married and I found out. <laughs> I found out. But like perfectionism was still in me, so much so that like when I found out that in my family and in my wife's family, we folded clothes differently. Which caused a problem because I was still a perfectionist. And the first time I found that my wife had rolled my socks. I was like, did nobody teach you in your house that you fold socks? And she was like, if you want them folded, you can do it. And so I did. But here's the, here's the breaking point. Now, now she, uh, you know, I pretty much fold my own laundry. I say pretty much because there are times where I don't. But one time she rolled my socks just to mess with me. She thought it'd be funny. <laughs> no, it's not. But I, I kid you not. She's right there, bright pink vest. She'd testify. She rolled my socks and I broke out in hives. I'm telling you, I had a physical reaction to the injustice that I was experiencing. I went through some counseling and now I'm doing okay because we fold them. But don't get any ideas. I'm telling you, don't right now. Uh, 
so much so, Maddie, our 14-year-old, came up to me. She's like, oh, talk about the time I did it. Listen, my family thinks it's funny to mess with me, and it's not funny. I'm confessing to you guys right now, it's not funny. So like I'm progressing, trying to lose this sense of perfectionism, and it wasn't working, and then we had kids. I will just tell you right now, nothing will eliminate a spirit of perfectionism more than a little kid. Because there's nothing you can do to prevent every spit up, diaper blowout, or just falling and breaking something in the house. And here's what I learned. I believe many of us have learned as well, maybe less painfully than I've learned. It's okay. Stuff breaks. Clothes get dirty. The report card isn't what we had. Like, and then life goes on. I think similarly... All of us are in the same boat of at one point in our life, we became marred. No matter how hard we tried, no matter all the things that we practiced, we rehearsed, there's no way to totally prevent not becoming marred. Why? It's the human condition. All of us have gone astray. All of us have made a mistake, a sinful action that has separated us from God. But aren't you glad the Bible says that it was marred, but it was still in the hand of God? of the potter. I was thinking this week, if you are here under the sound of my voice, watching by ministry of technology at a later time, if you are hearing this message, it means you're still in God's hand. It means there's still time for you because as long as you're in his hand, if you recognize that you've become marred, there's still time for you to repent. There's time for you to make a change. There's time for you to realize my failures weren't final. And that's something we're declaring when we're baptized in water, when we share testimony. This is how I was. There was a time in my life where I, this is how I was living. But then Jesus came and the Holy Spirit set me free. Set me free. I received revelation and now I've been made new. Our failures aren't final as long as we're still in his hand. Can I get a good amen? (laughs) And when we're baptized in water, what are we doing? We're signifying, we're, we're surrendering our brokenness to him. We're surrendering our faults and our flaws to him. And we're giving them to the only one who has the power to make us new again. And the Bible says that it was marred in his hands, but he began to make it into something new. Point number three, it's God's plans that give us purpose. It's God's plans that give us purpose. These people are dismissing themselves to go and get ready, change their clothes, to be baptized in water. If you didn't sign up, but you want to, you can go ahead. If you're in the band, this is a good time for you as well, because I'm moving toward a close, which is not the same as actually closing, but I am moving toward one. God's plans give us purpose. In the New King translation, New King James, it says, and so he made it again into another vessel. When I was a little kid, when I colored outside the lines, I would crumple it up and I would throw that piece of paper away. But the Bible says God can use us or use the broken pieces of our lives and he can make it again. I love this part, as it seemed good for the potter to make. He's got good plans for your life in spite of you being marred. He's got good plans for your life from this day forward. We say, hey, do God do it again with the same power and authority. I'm telling you, as you were hearing these testimonies, you ought to be encouraged that God is going to do it again. It's not a trick question. It's the name of the series. You've seen it on the sign, right? When you see this next testimony video, we've got another one coming up of a family bee that was baptized in water in the first service. When you hear their testimony, your spirit should be lifted knowing that God is going to do it Again, right, when you see all these people, dozens of people getting baptized, sons and daughters, moms and dads, coworkers and classmates, you ought to get excited because you know God is going to do it again. As we hear what he's done in school campuses and places of work, we're believing and we know confidently God is going to do it again. And it's his plans that give our lives purpose. Friends, there's no greater purpose than to follow God's plan for your life. 
Not what you've thought, or whatever, but I'm telling you, he's had these plans for a long time. Psalm 139 says, for you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. Jeremiah 1.5, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. Isn't that encouraging to know that God has great plans for your life even before you were born? Even before your parents met. This is why we know there's no accidental kids. There might be some kids that the parents didn't plan on, but it wasn't an accident. Humans for thousands of years have figured it out. But regardless of that, God knew. And it was God who formed that gift of life and breathed life into you. Be, it might be easy for some of us to think that when we were marred, when we were messed up, that we made it impossible for God to work through our lives. But thanks be to God, when we surrender fully to him, we repent of our sin, we surrender our life to Jesus Christ. The Bible says the old will be gone and the new will come. That's what we're saying. We've been made new. We're not glorifying our lives before Christ. We're not saying, look how awesome my life was, and then I met Jesus. <laughs> no, it's the opposite way, right? I was, I was relying on other people and addictive substances and things, and then I met God, and I realized all of these things were cheap substitutes, were lousy alternatives, were always falling short, And because when I met Jesus, when I experienced the all-encompassing, totally surpassing goodness of God, I realized nothing else could satisfy the way that he did, and I've been made new. That's what their testimony says on the sign in a moment. Just a couple of brief words of what their life was like before Jesus. And now we get to declare, this is who I am in Christ and I've been made new. It's God's plan that gives you purpose. Ephesians 2.10 says, for we are God's masterpiece. Maybe your translation says, uh, handiwork, maybe it says workmanship. I like the word that says masterpiece. You can be a piece of work if you want to be. I'm going to be a masterpiece. <laughs> it's the New Living Translation. Write it in your Bible. It'll encourage you, you know. Some of you are like, I married a piece of work. That's a different message. We're God's masterpiece. Created in Christ Jesus to do good works. I've never understood how a believer could think that I give my life to Jesus and then I sit there and do nothing until I go to heaven. You're missing so much. It says so clearly we were created in Christ to do good things. In other words, if you're not doing good things in this life, you're not doing what God created you to do. We're not called to sit there and do nothing. We're called and created. He designed, what does it actually say there? Which God prepared in advance for us to do. He's got the, the supplies, the assembly line. Have you ever done one of those feed my starving children food pack nights or maybe some other deals? And you just show up and it's like, it's, it's all there. I've never had to bring food. I just show up. And they're like, put a hairnet on and whatever, you know, but boom, here, pack, whatever. And it's all ready. I, I want you to know, friends, God has already made all the preparations for you to do the good things. So much so, he's preparing the people that you interact with. The Holy Spirit's already at work in their lives, cultivating the soil to receive the good news that he wants you to share with them. So far be it from us to ever be believers that says, well, I gave my life to Christ. I've done my deal. No, God still has good things that he's planned for you and I to do till he comes back for his church. There's good things for us to do. When we're baptized in water, one of the things, the last thing, and then we'll, we'll, oh no, I got a video. I was like, we'll call them out. There's a video. Okay, but... One of the things we're signifying is our willingness to be shaped as clay in his hands, right? We're coming in, we're saying, not only are we dead to sin, 
But we're saying we're surrendering our hopes and dreams and plans and desires and our agenda so that we can come alive in what he has. This, this is what we declare, right? And so, the, because there's nothing, well, let me say it this way. There's the two greatest days of your life are the day where you're born again and the day you realize your purpose in life. No greater day than those two days. Why? Because there's just something about, I'm telling you, let me just make it simple for you in this way, success. A lot of people have ideas, definitions, things. Success in life is simply knowing the will of God for your life and courageously walking in it. We're not even so much judged on the results of it. If we, when we lay our head on the pillow at night, there's no greater night's sleep that you can have than saying today I, I knew the will of God for my life and I courageously walked in it. You wanna know how to wake up with purpose and intentionality and vitality for the day? <laughs> know what God's will for your life is <laughs> and then courageously walk in it. And then we do the same thing the next day and the next day and the next day. When you know what God's will is for your life, you're way less uh, likely to succumb to everybody else's plans for your life. You're like, oh, calendar is already full with what God has asked me to do but we need the courage to walk in it because every day other people, well-meaning or not, might try to pressure us to deviate from what it is that God wants us to do. I was talking with a pastor last night and uh, was talking about that. If, if the devil can't get you to go backwards, can't get you to give up, I think he'll settle for you going sideways, getting distracted. I've seen it so much right now. My wife and I have such a burden to help pastors especially in this season to recognize the scheme of the enemy. And I speak it to you too. If you're strong in your faith, the odds of the devil trying to get you to just recant everything and walk away from your faith this afternoon is probably pretty small. But I can guarantee he'll settle, be happy with Take it as a win. If he can get you distracted, being involved in sideways energy, sideways things, because you're no longer moving forward in the plans and purpose that God has for your life. There's nothing greater. Success, I'm telling you, is knowing the will of God for your life and then courageously walking in it. I'll stop. I got some more. If you want the notes, I'll email it. But here's what we're going to do. We're going to watch another video, testimony video of what God has done in a family's life. They're baptized in the nine o'clock service. And then we're going to celebrate with a couple dozen people. So I'm not going to come back up after the video is over, but I remind you, uh, it's a moment of celebration. So if you friend or family, you want to cheer, you can get up close, you can film, take pictures, whatever it is. Uh, we're going to thank God. But let's, when the video's done and the worship team begins to lead us and people are coming out, let's stand to our feet if we're able. Let's clap, let's cheer, let's thank God for what he's doing in our lives. Amen. Let me pray and then we'll watch this video. Father, we thank you for all you're doing. For all you're allowing us to be part of, oh God. Here in your kingdom, seeing your kingdom come and your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. God, I give you thanks for these lives that have been forever changed. People have been forgiven, been set free. I want to declare to everybody that they're all in for you. God, thank you for allowing us to be part of your plan here on earth. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's watch this video today. <laughs> 